All right, so welcome to lecture four, Engineering 270. So I want to talk about um, control instructions, go-tos and branches. We introduced go-to in a previous lecture, and the basic syntax that I described was the following. You can have in your code what's called a label. Labels begin in column one, and it can be pretty much any word. There's a few reserved words, but a word like loop or begin or something like that, followed by a colon. And this doesn't generate machine code, but this tells the assembler when you see the word loop, it means the address of whatever the next instruction is. So later on in our code, if we say something like go to loop, this symbol loop gets replaced by the address of this instruction. And a go to says take this address, load that into the program counter, which means this will be the next instruction executed. So a go to does what a go to sounds like it should do. It basically causes the program to go to some other location instead of just the next successive instruction. So how do we code this in machine language? If you look on table 20-1 and you look up go to, and that's this right here, the first thing you'll notice is that it doesn't take just 16 bits, it actually takes 32 bits to code this instruction. It's a two word instruction. The first word is this eight bit opcode, followed by eight bits of literal, and the second word is a four bit opcode, followed by 12 bits of literal. So we have a total of 20 bits specified, and those 20 bits are the address that we're going to go to. So this is one way to change program flow, to cause your program to start executing at another spot, is to use a go-to statement. But it's a little expensive because it takes two instruction words instead of just a single word. An alternative is something called a branch. And the opcode for branch, the mnemonic is just BRA, shortcut for branch. And if you look at a branch instruction, it codes as a single instruction word, 16 bits. Now, how does this work? We have five bits of opcode, 11010, followed by 11 bits, which are some number n. Well, 11 bits, that might be enough to specify an instruction on this PIC processor, but other PIC processors have 16 or 32,000 instructions in their instruction memory, and 11 bits is not enough to specify one out of say 32,000 instructions. So how does this work? With a branch instruction, what we specify is an offset. In other words, instead of saying branch to this location, we say branch forward this many spots or branch backwards this many spots. So this number n is expressed in two's complement, so it can be positive or negative, and it basically says what should I add to the program counter? Or if it's negative, what should I subtract from the program counter? And so it lets us specify a branch to a location pretty close to the current instruction. And most branches in programs generally branch to something nearby. If you really want to go to the other side of the world, you can use a go to and you can specify this full um, instruction address. But if you're just branching a few instructions ahead or behind, such as in a loop like this, you can use a branch. It really makes no difference if you use a go-to other than it takes an extra instruction. But, um, but there's other reasons why we want to understand branches, and we'll get to those shortly. Um, now there's some homework questions that will help you figure out how these go-to and branch instructions get coded, what the actual value of this literal k or this signed number n should be for particular branches. And it's not quite as obvious as you might think that it would be. So there's some homework questions that will drill down into that. Um, but let me talk about um, some other ways that we can change what the next instruction is that's executed. And then we're going to come back and talk about branches. So another instruction that's useful is something called a call. And call is like a go-to. It takes two words to code. So here's a call instruction and it has a first word and a second word. And the, the first word consists of seven bits of opcode, something called S that we're gonna talk about much later. And then again, the um, 20 bits of literal information. 
And so just like a go to, a call can go to anywhere in the instruction memory. But a call is slightly different from a go to because when you say call, it remembers where that call instruction was. So you can say call and put in some label like call loop, and it will jump down and start executing code at that other location. But eventually, you can execute a return instruction, RET, and when, actually it's RET you are in on this processor. So the return instruction is just return. And when return is executed, the program jumps back to the instruction following the call. So if you've done CSE 121 programming in C, this is like a call to a function, and this is a return from the function. So call does the same thing as a go-to label, except that when you encounter return, it does another go-to, and it goes to the instruction right after the call. So we'll be looking at that in some homework questions. Um, so those are the main, the main mechanisms for changing program execution. Remember, normally, PC is set equal to PC plus 2, and since our instructions are 2 bytes, they're stored at location 0, 2, 4, 6, and so on. And so anytime we execute an instruction, the next instruction is usually the next one in memory. By saying go to, or call, or return, or branch, we can say, hey, don't do PC equals PC plus 2, do PC equals something else. And then the next instruction, instead of the, if we executed instruction 2, the next instruction instead of being 4, could be somewhere else in the instruction memory. So we can cause our program to do a branch or a go to. Okay, so um, the next lecture I want to talk about um, will be called conditional operations. And the basic motivation here is that to make general purpose programs, we need three things. We need sequential execution of statements. We need a way to loop. But we also need a way to do conditions. We need a way to do something like an if, then. If we have those three things, we have a general purpose programming language. Well, we've been talking about plain old execution of statements, right? Byte-oriented instructions, etc. Branches and go-tos will let us do looping. We need to add the missing piece, which is how we do conditionals, if-thens. So that's going to be our next lecture.